It's a, uh, extremely kind introduction, Joseph, and thank you very much. It's great to be back in Singapore and to see so many friends here. Usually these things, the only people you can count on are, are your parents and your, your brothers and sisters, but it's terrific to see such a great crowd here today. I will say my first conversation with Joseph many years ago, which he will not re recall, we spent 20 minutes comparing each of our uh, rugby injuries, each suggesting that ours was, mine was more serious than his, but we're, we're both still standing. Um, I also just want to say a word. It's great to see former colleagues from the State Department, uh, old friends in the audience, and I want to pay a particular tribute to, frankly, an inspiration behind this book, uh, uh, Kim Beasley. Uh, I know of no one who served over such a long period of time with such distinction. We think of the U.S.-Australian relationship as being set in stone. We do not recognize that in certain periods in our history, particularly around 1986, 1987, our alliance was hanging in the balance and it was left to a young defense minister at the time to make the decision that the United States and Australia had to stand together. Uh, he served with great distinction as uh, Australia's ambassador to Washington over five years, helped enormously as we secured uh, a commitment for U.S. forces to serve with uh, greater frequency in Australia, and was just a tr tremendous friend to all of us. So I want to just thank Kim for everything and thank uh, him for coming. For, first of all, for any of you who are thinking about writing a book, don't do it. Let me just so just 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 stop yourself. So what, what happens? when you're in government is that, you know, stuff just builds up in tide and you just think, I've just got to write this down. And you leave government and then you write it down, two or three hundred pages, you set it aside for a couple of months and then you pick it up and you think, oh my God, this is ridiculously bad. And, and then you have to really spend the time thinking through carefully what you want to communicate and what you want to explain. I, I wanted to accomplish a few things with this book. Um, I think first and foremost, I would argue that there are some central things that are not well understood in the United States. Probably the most important is a strategic recognition, and this is simple, that the lion's share of the history of the 21st century is going to be written in Asia. But if you look carefully at American diplomacy, American commercial activity, American military engagement, you, not, you would not necessarily know that from how we behave and that we have taken a detour of enormous strategic consequence away from what I think will be a defining feature of the 21st century. And I think we are now entering a period in which it will be essential for the United States to find ways to spend more time, attention, and focus on Asia during a period in which our commitments in the Middle East and South Asia are going to continue to be onerous, difficult, and probably not particularly rewarding. So the number one argument of the book is to recognize, and we try to lay out, I try to lay out in this book clearly what the stakes are. Many Americans just do not understand the manifestations of how rapidly Asia has risen, the potential for its rising middle classes, um, the security threats, and frankly, the role that the United States has played uh, over a period of decades. I try to make the case that one of the most important contributions of the United States is that we have helped create, along with friends like Singapore and others, an operating system in Asia upon which the remarkable last 40 years has been built. And that operating system involves uh, a strong commitment to the preservation of peace and stability, commitment to freedom of navigation, peaceful resolution of disputes, the rule of law, and the enforcement of contracts. And that this operating system, loosely uh, agreed upon, has propelled Asia into this remarkable position in the 21st century, and that key components of that compact are now in question. And so the book is an attempt to articulate the historical role that the United States has played in trying to propel this forward. I try to be honest in the book, though, in pointing out the many times that the United States has gotten it wrong in Asia and why historically we've treated Asia often as a second tier uh, 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 significant region uh, uh, below uh, the Soviet Union and uh, Europe during the Cold War 
and uh, beneath the Middle East and South Asia over the last 10 or 15 years of the war on terror. So the book is an attempt to make an honest assessment of where the United States needs to step up our game. At the beginning of the Obama administration, there was some back and forth, which I thought was a little bit unfortunate, in which some people said after some speeches and engagement that we are back in Asia, right? And the response was, uh, actually, the United States never left. And I would say that both are just fundamentally incorrect. Um, for the United States to be back in Asia or to suggest a strong role will take a substantial period of time. The costs of engagement, successful engage up, ha, engagement, have gone up dramatically. The expectations of the American role have gone up dramatically. And it will take a succession of presidents, not just one, and in both parties to secure a stronger role in Asia going forward. And at the same time, we have to recognize that during a period of the last 10 or 15 years, there is a belief in Asia that we have been preoccupied elsewhere. We have not been as focused consequentially at the highest levels uh, on Asia. That does not mean that there has not been very determined diplomats of Republican Democratic stripe that have supported the American engagement in Asia, but it has not enjoyed yet the level of strategic commitment that will be essential um, over time. Um, the book, uh, I tried to make sure that it had lots of funny stuff. Almost all of it is directed against me, alas. Um, I've got some great stories. I will tell you one and then explain a little bit about um, why I think uh, writing a book like this is important. Uh, just at the outset, just so you understand, um, in government, when you come up with an idea and you work with your senior colleagues and you roll it out, 99 times out of 100, it goes out and then immediately disappears from view, immediately. And you try to point it out to your friends in the media and they're like, what, what are you talking, I, I don't even know what you're talking about. And, and it's lost from view. I have only been involved in one thing where you roll it out and then you are immediately awash with questions. What does this mean? Did you think about these consequences and these implications? And I have been always struck at how ineffectively we rolled out the pivot. And for that, I have to plead guilty. I just don't think we did a particularly good job in explaining what were the things that we wanted to accomplish, what were the objectives. And in fact, I found myself I helped write that article that Joseph graciously quoted from. I had people asking me, well, what does this particular phrase mean? Sort of textual analysis that, you know, we used to do in criminology. And I remember thinking, I wrote that in the middle of the night on a flight home. I don't remember what I meant by that. You know, I'll have to go back and figure that out. And, and for me, the, the most important mistakes that, frankly, have to be addressed are at the core the idea that we would be pivoting away from Europe, for instance. Everything that the United States has ever done of value on the global stage, we have done with Europeans. And the idea that we would be turning away from Europe is so antithetical to our strategic interests. What we intended to uh, indicate is that, in fact, no region is looking more rapidly to Asia than Europe. And that one of the things that will be most important going forward will be a high-level strategic dialogue between the United States and Europe about Asia so that we can work together like we did in the uh, opening up in Burma and Myanmar and other places as well. Um, it is also the case that we cannot cut and run from the Middle East. Nothing could be more antithetical to our strategic interests. And in fact, no place would that be felt more keenly than in Asia, because Asia looks very carefully at how the United States follows through on its commitments. And so the real challenge is to find the wit and wisdom, that time around the edge, to find more focus and attention in Asia during a time where we are consequentially uh, involved elsewhere. Um, uh, I also try to go into some detail about the nomenclature involved. I was part of a small group that used the terminology pivot. Uh, I think most of the U.S. government preferred the term rebalance. I think rebalance seemed more carefully contrived. We 
thought of the term pivot more like a basketball player that could move from side to side with a stable um, uh, core, but I think it was perceived more as uh, the idea of turning away. And so I think in many respects that, that conceptualization uh, did not play in our favor. I, I was on the losing end of that. Those of us who used Pivot were sent to re-education camps. I had to, I had to wear a scarf. I, I dug with a hoe. Um, I, this is true, actually. My, my, one of my young daughters uh, uh, dances ballet. She was about seven, and I remember last year as I was trying to finish up the book, I was sitting and her ballet teacher, all these little girls are in pink tutus. This is a true story. And, 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 and the ballet teacher is saying, okay, girls, now let's everyone pivot. And she's saying it over and over, and I'm getting more and more uncomfortable. And, <laughs> and I almost said, don't, don't you mean rebalance? Don't you mean rebalance? So, so, uh, so the book tries to underscore historically where we are and articulate a vision on the way forward. Um, my hope is that we do find this middle ground between too hot and too cold. I, I will say that I, I'm a strong and firm believer of a diversified American commitment in Asia. I think it is important for the United States to embed our China policy in a larger Asian framework. I think we need a consequential engagement with our partners. I think it is essential that we work closely with India. We need a strong, diversified defense strategy. Trade is essential. We have to show that we are optimistic, engaged in the world. I'm a very strong supporter of TPP. Nothing is going to change that. We need to work to strengthen institutions, the East Asia Summit, the ASEAN Regional Forum. We have to work to secure ASEAN's central role as a convener of all Asians more generally. And I think as importantly as anything else, we have to sustain American domestic support for Asian engagement. So one of the most important things is not for American presidents to give speeches out in Asia, right? Asians actually know already the importance of the American role. Where those speeches and engagement will be necessary, much more going forward, will be inside the United States. So the book begins with some sort of general observation of what it's like to get interviewed for a job at the State Department and how that feels. And then it really concludes for me um, with my last trip with President Obama, Secretary Clinton, when we were asked to go with him uh, uh, on his first maiden visit at the end of tw uh, 2012 uh, to Myanmar. And it was a, I had worked for years behind the scenes on the diplomacy with the generals about the release of Aung San Suu Kyi. I'd had the opportunity to, you know, to work in what I thought was really a remarkable opening uh, to a country that had long been essentially uh, uh, outside of the global community. And so was asked to go with the secretary and the president. And so it's, you know, it's kind of an exciting thing. You're asked to go on Air Force One. You know, uh, you're one of a small group of people. You're, you get up early in the morning. You, you know, you're incredibly nervous when you get on the airplane because you're sure there's not going to be a seat for you. You know, and you sit down and got to brief the president. And, and, and just like you read, the president and his team are incredibly co cool. They're like cool, like cool American cool, like cool is the other side of the pillow. And I am just not that way. And so I had to really try to contain myself and, and show that I belonged in the no drama Obama crowd. Very, very difficult for me. And so we, uh, uh, we were on the airplane. Secretary Clinton asked us to come up, myself and Jake Sullivan. We briefed the president, got him ready for this visit. We were all very excited. He, he, the briefing went well. He was gracious to us. And so as I was walking back to my seat, it's a short flight. We were flying up from Bangkok. Uh, to uh, Yangon, I thought to myself, you know, I have, a, I have a bunch of young daughters at home. This would be a good time. I'm not going to be an Air Force One. I should get some stuff. Like, you know, it's, it's only right, right? You know, that's, that's what you're on the airplane for. And so I'm, this is a true story. And so, so I started putting stuff in my jacket pocket. <laughs> So, but not like most people just like take matches and M and M's. So I got a like a, a like a, a flashlight, one of those big flashlights from the <laughs> cockpit, and um, a couple of ashtrays. I I think I got a life jacket, and so and I'd stuff them all. And so I looked pretty much like a scarecrow. This is a true story. This is absolutely true. 
So I was, and I'm feeling nervous about it. I feel guilty. It's wrong to steal from Air Force One. And so I sat down. <laughs> so I sat down, and we land, and the uh, president graciously asked Secretary Clinton, will you walk out the front of the airplane with me? And I thought that was great. And I looked out, and my dear friend Derek Mitchell, who was our new ambassador, was there. And I thought to myself, this is, you know, it's one of those rare moments where you want to stop for five minutes. It happens so irregularly in government and feel good about things, but you don't have time. So because I, you know, you are, you are assigned a car as you land, and there's about 50 cars. I think there were 56 cars. I was in car 56 because it's, it's, it's by rank, and I had the last car. And so we land, and so you got to go off the back of the airplane, and you got to run. you got to hustle. If you miss the motorcade, it's over. It's, it's <laughs> completely over. And so I went out the back. It's 1,000 degrees, as you all know. And you know, you're in a dark suit. And so I'm running along the, and I can see the car mirage in the distance. <laughs> so I'm running, and I notice, I look out of the corner of my eye, there are two Secret Service agents following me. This is true. <laughs> And so I start running a little faster, and, and they run faster too, and I am certain they're coming for the stuff that I've stolen off Air Force <laughs> One. This is a true story, I swear. And so I'm making my way, and they're gaining on me, so I pick up the speed, and I start throwing stuff out, like, you know? <laughs> like, chap, they're not, gonna, they're not gonna catch me with stuff on me, you know? And so I'm running and running, and finally they're calling after me, Dr. Campbell, Dr. Campbell, and I am just panicked and, pan and literally, just so anxious, and so they finally catch up to me, and I'm right about to confess. And they say, oh, Dr. Campbell, thank God they were a lot of breath too. I felt good about that. And they said, Dr. Campbell, the president wants you to ride with him into town in the limo. And I'm like, oh yes, of course, of course. And so, <laughs> so I gather up all the stuff, and we run back, literally run back a, a mile the other direction as the limo is waiting. And so we get there, and it, it is impossible to describe how sweaty I was. Impo it was like I had gone swimming in a vat of hot water. Just imagine like cellophane pulled over a plate of potato salad. That's what it looked like. Really unattractive, just completely. And so I, I climb in the car. Everyone's looking like, oh God, who is this guy? And so there's a little jump seat right across from the president. And so I sat on it and got in the car and sat down and just tried to gather myself. And so we just start driving. And about a minute in, he said, Tell me everything about Myanmar. Tell me everything about Burma. And so I started explaining the history and talking about every aspect of, you know, its modern travails and its challenges. And, it, you know, I kind of, I did what you're never supposed to do. I got lost in the story and just, you know, just completely explained all the beauty and the tremendous opportunities. And as we're arriving into town, I turned my attention. I said, Mr. President, and if you look to the right, there's Shwedogon Temple, 99 meters tall, the greatest collection of gold in Southeast Asia, tremendous spiritual meaning to the people of Southeast Asia, particularly Myanmar. And I said, you know, really, no visit to Myanmar is complete without a trip to <laughs> Shwedogon Temple. And I did not realize that I just stepped in it because the Secret Service had said, absolutely not, you cannot go. Apparently, it's, you got to take your shoes off, and it's harder to shoot stuff and bare feet. I don't know. <laughs> and so, and so, so anyway, on the fly, they rerouted and, made, and let the president go there, which turned out to be a great part of the trip. So we had a wonderful part of the trip, except for like the Secret Service guy went like this to me, like, like just to <laughs> let me know how valuable I was to the trip. So I, I tried to write a book that is, is meant to be meaningful. Uh, it has a lot of tributes in it to the people I worked with. I have to say the greatest people I ever worked with were uh, colleagues in the State Department. I had, I'd been one of those people that worked pretty much everywhere else in government, had contempt for the State Department because I'd never worked there. I will tell you now, I will work no other place if I ever went back into government. I love the State Department. Love the people I had a chance to serve with. Um, tremendous people. You know, if you're in the military, people fall all over yourselves to say thank you for your service, as you should. Civil servants, foreign service officers never get that, but serve with tremendous devotion and dedication behind the scenes. So, so I'm just happy the book is out. I'm a little nervous, but you know, because I'm sure that there's something I've forgotten or some country I've left out, like China or something like that. But <laughs> I, I will say I make very clear that the United States and China are destined to work together, that we must find a way forward. The period ahead will be filled with more tensions. But acknowledging those tensions, recognizing them directly rather than pretending they don't exist, will be uh, 
the central feature of a more effective relationship going forward. Why don't I stop here, guys? I'm sorry to go on so long. This is my first book talk. You can see how out of practice I am. Happy to take any questions or observations or let Joseph determine the way forward. And again, thank you all for coming out today. I really appreciate it.